Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's December 19th. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. So, I know all of you are probably stressed right now. It's December, making plans for the holidays, cooking, cleaning, buying presents for the spouse and kids, traveling. It's always a stressful month. And now you're dealing with extra stress with the markets, which continue to fall outside of what? The occasional one or two days it goes higher, which we've seen on Tuesday. And I'm doing this podcast right now, taping it at 11 a.m. before the Fed meeting, which I'll get to in a minute. But the market's doing well right now. It's up. But these bounces, especially not just December, but November, even October, are now being used as selling opportunities. I mean, think about that, right? A lot different compared to the past three, four years. Every time the markets fell, it was a great buying opportunity. Get back in. Go buy these stocks. You know what? I have news for you. The selling is likely going to continue, at least through year end, which I know is almost here, but probably into January. Because it's not fundamentally based. I mean, I've been saying this for a while. You look at the market right now, we're trading at 15 times forward earnings on the S&P 500, 15 times forward earnings. And you want to put that in perspective. That's the lowest P, the S&P 500, on a forward basis since 2004, right? It's almost five years. And the last time that happened, and stocks got this cheap, and that was, to put exactly it on, it was October 2014, the S&P surged more than 35% seven months later. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it can happen because we're at relatively cheap levels. So you look at it and say, well, it's so cheap. It was cheap 10% ago. The market was cheap in on January 1st, 2009. It was cheap. It, it, was, it, it turned out to be a great buying opportunity. If you bought there and still held stocks now, you're doing great. But those, that three-month period with all the sentiment and all everything, people forget the market crashed another what was it, 30%, 20%, 30% through March until it hit the low, which was what, 666, and then boom, took off for eight straight years <laughs> or even longer. But when we're looking at what's going on, and I know a lot of you look at your portfolio saying, I cannot believe this stock is that. It's not the stock, it's the markets. And I know it's frustrating. I'm not saying it's not frustrating. It is. But we stick to the fundamentals and you look at them because earnings are growing. They're not going to grow by 25% like they did last quarter, more than 20% last couple of quarters, a lot of that due to you know, tax reforms. But they are going to grow 7 8% easily over the next 12 months. And I say easily because I'm not including the hundreds of billions of dollars in buybacks that have already been announced. I mean, Apple announced its own $100 billion buyback itself. And you're looking at the risks, which you read about every day, which are made to scare the crap out of you, right? This way you're reading everything. You're going to be talking about all the holidays. That's what drives the media. Remember, it's page views. They want to just scare the hell out of you as much as you can. They've been talking about trade wars since February. And our market hit all-time highs through September. Now saying, wow, these trade wars are a little serious. They're much more serious with China, right? And everything that's going on. Because what we know is China can't sustain this. I mean, I've talked to my contacts, and they've come on this podcast and said they're not really worried. They're worried now because they can't continue to play hardball. I, politics aside, I'm not saying, well, we're the U.S. and they got to deal with it. No, it's not that. Listen, I'm talking from a perspective of your portfolio, and that's all I care about, right, is making you guys money. Okay, so leave the politics aside. Leave everything aside. Leave if you think we're, we're wrong or right doing this China, whatever. Leave that aside. you got to deal with what's happening. That's what happened during the credit crisis, guys. Because in 2010, 2011, everybody complained that I cannot believe we bailed out the banks. It's so ridiculous. You're right. Nobody could believe it. Everybody hated it. Nobody got arrested. But you know what? The federal government, our government, backed everything. They took risk completely off the table. They took all the bad assets. Think about 
Think about how crazy Barclays was. What a bunch of idiots during the credit crisis. They had the opportunity to take over Lehman, which we let go bankrupt, which everybody high-fived each other until about a week when the whole entire system collapsed and all the credit froze. Barclays had a shot to buy Lehman Brothers, right? And you might say, wow, well, why is that good? It's good because the Fed was going to take all of the garbage off their balance sheet to stabilize Lehman and say, hey, just buy Lehman. We'll backstop all the garbage like we're doing with Bear Stearns. And that's why, you know, everything they gave to JP Morgan, all that, all the Merrill Lynch, all those deals, they took all the garbage and said, we'll put them in one pool. We'll back them. We just got to stabilize the system and we'll throw money into the banks. And Barclays said, you know what? Nah, we're not going to do it. <laughs> Would have been a pretty good decision, right? So instead of complaining back then, right, and say, wow, the whole freak, you know, everyone went to jail, what your mindset should be as someone who owns stocks and has a portfolio is there's zero risk in the marketplace. They were giving us checks to buy houses. They were giving us checks to buy cars. So again, politics aside, personal feelings aside, this is about your portfolio. And when you're looking at China, they cannot continue to play hardball unless they want to fall into a depression because they're already in a recession when it comes to manufacturing, housing. Retail sales last month grew at their slowest pace in 15 years. It's going to get worse. GDP expected to grow north of 7% next year. Now those estimates are 6%, and that's still super optimistic. So China's going to have to come to the census. They're already doing that. They worked out a deal to lower order tariffs. They're going to continue to do it because they cannot sustain this. They'll do it behind closed doors, and they'll say, we really didn't agree. We'll play it, whatever they need to do. As an investor, that risk is going to come off the table. It has to because China does not want to fall into a depression. And it will happen soon. So for me, I don't see that as a big risk in 2019. You know, maybe for the first few months. Another risk, higher interest rates. Again, I'm doing this podcast before, right? Before. So I'm doing it before they're going to meet. Right now, there's a 60% chance the Fed is going to raise rates. That was more 80%. It came down. So they're probably going to raise by a quarter point, if I had a guess, and then come out and say, look, you know, we're not going to raise. They won't say they won't raise for all 2019. That would be a surprise. But they're probably going to say, look, we're going to be put on hold and monitor conditions a little better. And let's face it, you know, you're looking at higher interest rates, of course. You know, it's going to result in slower growth, right? That's normal. That's fine. But the big overhang with the Fed is not just about tightening, you know, or raising rates which I agree with over the past two years. I mean, we're at zero. We need to go back to some kind of normal level. I, I get it. But there's tons of uncertainty where the Fed was basically saying, you know what, we're raising rates no matter what. I mean, six months ago. No matter what, I mean, you know, look at the data first. Look what's going on. We're seeing housing come down tremendously. We're seeing a lot of things. You see consumer spending come down, manufacturing come down. Just a little bit, not to recession, but you're seeing this impact where maybe you shouldn't be so aggressive, but more important is the uncertainty of what they're going to do. Because you have public figures like Kramer, which has a big influence, whether you like him or not. Again, I work for him. I like him. But some people don't. That's fine. I get it. I understand. You like whoever you want to like. But calling him out every day on his show, Mad Money, and saying, you know, they're crazy. You know, they they got to stop raising rates. And again, he has a history of being right with that. What did the last blow up and crazy meltdown he had, but he was right when he said they had no idea. They were raising rates while, you know, during a credit crisis. You also have the president's been vocal, right? Pissed off the Fed, continues to raise rates, saying it like in every other tweet nowadays. Again, forget politics. I don't care what you think of Trump. This is about your portfolio. My point is it creates uncertainty, and that's a killer for the markets. So no one knows what the Fed's going to do. Right now, we're seeing, you know, I'm guessing, and I'm, I'm doing this, telling you again, 11 o'clock, and the market's up. I'm looking over 200 points. It was up yesterday. And I could see it being up because if the Fed says, hey, you know what? We're going to stop raising rates. Or if they don't raise rates today and also say we're not going to do it through 2019, which I don't think they're going to say. I just think they'll say, you know, more like, you know, wait and see approach and stuff like that. But we're going to, you know, calm down a little bit. And the market probably go up a little higher. I don't know. Maybe it finishes down 500 points. That's the way it's been, up 500, down 500. 3% moves either direction in a market. I mean, crazy volatility, more than I've seen. Again, because it's not fundamentally based. But getting back to the Fed, if they do stop raising rates, it's going to be a positive. At least, you know, in the short term, since higher rates are impacting consumer spending, they're definitely impacting housing. I mean, we've seen the numbers come out, which one of the biggest drivers of the economy, along with overall consumer spending. And what are we seeing in the markets? 
I mean, the markets are starting to fall. They're falling. You, you know, you see a company like Apple is the largest in the world, the best company in the world, down 30, 35% from its highs. Dow components down more than 20%. We're triggering stops left and right. You know, we got a lot of stocks early, but yes, you know, we're going to fall along with everybody else. And get to where I'm going with this, which is very important. So bear with me. But you're looking at those higher rates, and what is it also impacting? International markets, overseas, right? Their debt is price in dollars. U.S. dollars continues to rise. It's strong. It's hurting them. But that's going to be a risk that could come off the table. China, the trade war, and the Fed, which has been, you know, two big risks pushing down this market, could come off the table very, very soon. But these are risks. They're out there, no doubt. But right now, the markets are trading as if we're currently in a recession. That's what they're trading at. 15 times forward earnings, that's what you're saying, that they're currently in a recession. And we're not. The numbers don't suggest it. We're slowing down. It's a big difference. Yes, spending, housing, earnings, slowing down. In fact, there's little evidence that a recession will occur over the next two to three years. That could change in a heartbeat, as you know. Remember, spending is a function of sentiment, optimism. When people are scared and markets continue to fall further, they will start to spend less. Maybe that's happening now. We'll see the holiday numbers. And they're going to save more. Now, for the millennials out there, you may say, well, saving is the right thing to do. If you're, you're you know, a, a self-help guru, save your money. You want to save your money. I get it. You should be saving your money. But when it comes to the economy, saving is terrible, right? You want to have people spend money. And that's, that's the goal. And that's where the economy drives itself. And that's why credits and debt is such a big thing. But when you're looking at spending, I mean, you know, again, a function of optimism, that could change in a heartbeat, and that could push us into recession. I mean, again, I don't see this happening. I'm just, you know, throwing it out there. Again, I don't see it happening at least over the next 18 months. But we're seeing stocks continue to slide, mostly for obvious reasons right now. Look, the markets were up a ton through September. You can say they were up a ton for the last, you know, seven years. So as they were up through September, what's happening? Well, a lot of people took profits on their big winners, including us on our portfolios. Took a lot of profits and a lot of stocks. They were up 300%, 200%, 100%, sell half positions and stuff like that. Took our profits. So now we'll, we have profits on our portfolio. And all of a sudden, hey, you know what? My blue chip portfolio that's supposed to be stable, I'm seeing consumer staples down 15 20% now. You know what? Let me sell some of these, right, to offset my losers for tax purposes. So now you see the whole market come down. Now that can result in, in more and more selling. Also, think about mutual funds, hedge funds, private equity firms. And some of these managers, almost all of them get paid, you know, based on performance. They make a base salary, but they get a bonus based on performance. And you know what? As a portfolio manager, it's pretty smart to lock in your gains before year end, especially if you see the markets coming down, right? I mean, through September, you're high five and going, wow, honey, we're going to buy two new houses. And next thing you know, your performance went from up 5 7% to down 4 or 5%. And to stop that and to you, know, you start selling out of positions, it can happen very, very quickly, guys. I mean, the way the market is, we haven't seen a market pullback like this since the credit crisis. And what's happened over those years? I mean, algorithm trading, you're looking at passive investing, ETFs. And what is it? Van Eck. And who else do you have? You have BlackRock. I mean, you're looking at... at, at you know, two or three that control 30% of all the money in the stock market right now. That's how high it is. I mean, State Street, you, you, I mean, you're looking at, at these companies, uh, Vanguard. So it's Vanguard, BlackRock, uh, Van Eck. I mean, you're looking at those three when it comes to ETFs. I mean, holy cow. And you're looking at 25, 30% where they own every stock. If you look, look at the largest owners of any stock in the S&P 500, and I guarantee you Vanguard and BlackRock are going to be in the top five. They own everything. That's how big they are. So they're not even selective. Well, oh, we should own this. No. They create a massive ETF that owns everything. So when you're getting redemptions, everything's being sold. You're not diversified here. It doesn't matter what you own. But you're looking at all this, and it almost causes more selling. Like I said, fundamentally, the market's sound. I mean, don't worry about debt levels. It's something that's been a concern for over 70 years you know, when it comes to debt, the only thing that matters is being paid, and it's being paid on time. And based on the banks, the Fed, it is. And of course, interest rates are really, you know, you say interest rates are the most important thing. But again, companies are paying off debt, paying it on time, you know, which is key. And I know debt's a hot topic. Bears love talking about. 
But I have to tell you, there's tons of warning signs and indicators that we'll see if this becomes an issue, including monitoring the bank's balance sheets, loan losses, major moves in the bond market, credit default swaps on banks here and internationally. And these are things, you know, credit default swaps, guys, are basically insurance against the possibility of default. And you'll see these things trade and, you know, give you a good indication like, whoa, you better be worried. What we see with, you know, Deutsche Bank. And right now, there's no evidence of warning signs that, you know, debt is a big concern. Yeah, there's, there's indicators that we will monitor and look at that, that will let us know that. But right now, it's okay. So what do we have? We have the markets falling, not fundamentally based. As an individual investor, what do you do? What does that mean? And it means that you need to limit your risk. This is something that we preach in our newsletter, something I preach on the podcast. Look, I hate taking losses. You hate taking losses. We all hate taking losses. But I have to tell you, every stock we stopped out at in the past month or two is probably down another 15 20% from there, not because of fundamentals. These are good names. And I know you're looking at your portfolio going, man, I can't believe that this stock is down 30%. They just reported good earnings, but it's the market. Everything's selling off. So it's important to limit your risk. Don't fight the trend. No matter how good the numbers look, it doesn't matter. Because to be honest, the market was cheap in early November, just like the market was cheap, like I told you, in January 2009, before it really came down. Would have been the ultimate buying opportunity to buy in March 2009. I think it was March 12th was the date, is the actual date, March 11th maybe to buy. But in reality, January was a good time to buy, but man, it, it cost you. You're like, whoa, holy cow, I can't believe we fell even more. But I can't tell you the number of stocks I'm seeing that are trading below 10 times earnings, growing those earnings more than 15% and paying a 2.5% yield. Guys, I've been screening for stocks for 20 years. It's rare. That's rare that you see that. Doesn't mean that if you buy now, it's going to go down. You can scale into certain positions, but... More important, if you own stocks and they're coming down, you have to limit your risk. Be sure to follow your stops. This will keep money on the sideline. Again, you're going to take losses. It's not fun, but it's a lot worse when you're taking a 70 or 80% loss, which you're going to see. I mean, I screened for small caps recently. Amazing statistics. And you look at, at 17% of that index, stocks, 17% of the stocks are down 50% plus. You only have 30% that are actually showing gains. It's like 27%. But think about it. That's a big portion of that index that's down more than 50% these stocks over the past year or year to date. So by keeping money or the powder dry, we call it, it gives you the opportunity to buy a lot of these stocks as they come down. Again, scaling into these positions, you know, doing smart things. But bear markets are great for people that are prepared. And you prepare by limiting your losses. You're going to take losses. It's fine. Everyone in the world takes losses. It's the people that limit their losses when times aren't good because those are the guys that are able to buy money, to use that money, that have cash when everybody doesn't have cash, and they're able to buy assets at much, much cheaper prices. Now. I put together a special interview today with a good friend. His name is Dr. Richard Smith. He's a CEO and founder of Tradesmith. He's a PhD in math and sense of science. Richard spent most of his career finding ways to help individual investors reduce their risk by using stop losses, position sizing, asset allocation. About to have a great and detailed, very awesome conversation with him about his company, his motivation behind helping individual investors manage their portfolios, and how to use simple tools to reduce your risk. Because bear markets, again, are the greatest thing in the world for people who are prepared. Doesn't mean you're not going to take losses, like I said, but it's about limiting those losses, having that drive power on the sidelines. Very, very important. So my interview with Rich, guys, please listen to it once, twice, 10 times, because it's going to help you become a better investor, which means helping you manage your portfolio better, and not just through the great times where everyone's a superstar when the markets are going higher for seven, eight straight years and everyone's high five and it's awesome. But even through the bad times. Later on in my educational segment, I'm going to go even further about risk management because I'm going to give you a real life example of how I save my subscribers a fortune. Because I limit my risk on one of the best dividend paying companies in the world. So full disclosure, I'm going to talk about one of my losers. And I know you almost never see this from money managers, especially from financial newsletter editors, since it's terrible marketing. But forget about that. It's more important because this segment is going to help you become a better investor since we always, even though we don't want to admit it, but we always learn more from our losers or mistakes compared to our winners. 
So get to that special education segment in a few. But first, let's bring in Dr. Richard Smith, CEO and founder of Tradesmith. And here's that interview right now. Dr. Richard Smith, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's great to be here, Frank. I've wanted to be on your show for a while now. So really looking forward to spending this time together. I appreciate that. Now, I'm sure the audience and the listeners don't know this, but we go back a long way where, you know, we were at Stansbury together and you worked with Steve Sugarwood a lot, Amelia Island, which is, you know, I was working out of that yeah, office yeah, with him, yeah. Tom Dyson and all those guys. And yep. so I got a chance to see you a lot. And you were even my golf partner a few times. I think you beat me a couple of times, which is, yeah, maybe I shouldn't even mention that, but <laughs> who who knew back well. then, right? And we're talking four or five years ago that we would both have our own publishing firms, you know, me with Curzier Research, you with Tradesmith. Uh, go over what made you start this company? When did you, because I know you were working with Stansbury a lot. What made you say, you know what, I, I want to make a difference. This is what I want to launch. This is what I want to do. Uh, and, and give listeners maybe a little bit of background on what you're doing right now because you're growing tremendously. Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, going back to sort of why I went into business for myself in the first place, you know, I finished my PhD and I just thought, well, I could go into academia. Nah, that doesn't sound very fun. <laughs> and I actually read this quote from uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, President Wilson. He was asked, he was the president of a university and he went on to become president of the U.S. And he's like, well, you know, why did you want to become president of the U.S. instead of president of Princeton? And he was like, well, I couldn't take the politics anymore. <laughs> you know the politics in uh, academia you know are like so petty and brutal and uh but you know i really wanted to innovate i wanted to develop my own stuff i wanted to develop my own team i wanted you know i love the creativity of business and uh and 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 the opportunity to innovate in ways that you know you just can't really do in academia or in uh in research institutions so you know, it just has built kind of over the years. And then uh, five, six years ago, I, I took on partners and uh, that definitely accelerated, uh, you know, the trajectory and, and the learning curve, you know. Um, I mean, you've been in business yourself for a few years now, Frank. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot to learn, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I mean, you could, we could even go on, <laughs> on about that. I mean, because for me, when I was working, I was just writing newsletters and then, you know, Stansbury hired me. I worked there for a while. I worked for another firm briefly. And I, my job was just, you know, write newsletters. And, and that was cool. And I, I never really appreciated how much goes behind this. It's more than just writing a newsletter, designing, oh going up, make sure your, your marketing is in tune, make sure everything, everyone's on the same page, when to market, marketing schedules. It, it's, you know, just dealing with different people. And I never... You know, now when it comes to Porter Stansberry, it comes to Mike Ward and a lot of the biggest publishers that we have out there, uh, Aaron DeHook, I, I really have an appreciation for what they do because I didn't realize how many moving parts and how difficult it is. I love it, but I'm sure you're going through the same stuff yourself. And how about recruiting? <laughs> uh, <laughs> recruiting is always fun and, and, and dealing executing, with employees. Right. Making yeah. plans, setting goals, achieving them, you know, uh, saying no to things that you'd really like to do, but you can't do them because you don't have the resources and it's an opportunity cost, right? So, um, you know, business has just been uh, a shockingly creative experience for me. You know, I, you know, I went to Berkeley back uh, from my undergrad, so I was heavily indoctrinated in kind of the anti-business liberal <laughs> realities, you know, not realities, uh, you know, um, ideologies, I should say, right? So it took me a while to kind of warm up to, um, you know, the create the creative side of business. But man, it's a uh, it really uh, um, calls you on the carpet, so to speak. You know, you got to perform every day. You got to be creative. You got to talk to people. You know, it's it's awesome. I love it. Yeah, me too. Me too. And networks are so important and having people that help me out and people ask questions to. And like you said, you partner with someone that, that, you know, may a few people that really accelerate the process, but it is, it's, it's, you know, even the yeah. biggest, the business managers that they're doing for 20 years, it's always a learning experience, you know, you, especially at the beginning for you entrepreneurs out there. I think one of the mistakes I made is you want to do everything at once because you have so many good ideas and you're like, wait a minute, you don't have the resources for that. So you have to just step back a little bit and focus on, okay, here's, this is what's going to generate money for us. And when we do that, okay, now we can launch a new product. Now we can do this. It's, you know, but um, just that that whole period of just learning and stuff. It's it's been fantastic. Like you said, I, I love it. It's a great business. Uh, it's a high margin business, and if you get it right, and uh, 
it could be really good. But like you, Rich, and we talked about this, it, it, it's it's not like, hey, you know, we're creating these businesses and, and you know, I, I want to be worth a hundred million dollars tomorrow. So, it, I mean, you have a passion for doing the right thing for the investors. And why don't you get into that a little yeah. bit with trade stops? Because what I love about your system is you talk about things that people or individual investors, mom and pop investors don't really think about, not in a bad way. But when you're buying a stock, yeah. what do you think about? How much money I'm going to make with you? And using your system, it's, listen, in case you're wrong, because unfortunately we're all going to be wrong sometimes, here's the risk management you need to to use. Talk a little bit about that system, which which is great for investors. Well, you know, it all has grown out of my own firsthand experience as an investor, Frank, <laughs> going back to uh, the late 90s when I first started investing, 1998, 99, right? The dot-com boom is going on. You know, uh, I scraped together my life savings, which amounted to $10,000 at the time. I'm still working on my PhD and I run it up, you know, in like, in like a year to $40,000 and I'm feeling pretty good patting myself on the back. March 2000 rolls around and, you know, like your portfolio is going down 5%, sometimes 10% in a day, you know, <laughs> and you have no idea how to react and no idea how to manage that situation. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I barely got out of that market with my initial capital intact. And I know that a lot of other people uh, didn't get out with their initial capital intact, which is pretty sad to say. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a real wake up call for me that, hey, you know, it's one thing to uh, be getting great information, great ideas, um, you know, even to have good stocks in your portfolio. It's a totally different thing to actually manage risk, manage your own emotions, make consistently good decisions that aren't like, you know, uh, um, uh, emotionally driven or impulsive, right? Um, just a quick side story related, but uh, oh, who's the guy that was Trump's right-hand man for a while? That, uh, uh, Steve Bannon, right? So, uh, you know, his father, Marty Bannon, had worked for AT&T his whole life and his um Marty's father had worked for AT&T his whole life and they had like, he had all his money in retirement and sort of family wealth tied up in AT&T stock. And at the bottom of the, you know, 2009 uh, stock market crash, um, Marty's watching TV and he, and he can't take it anymore. And he sells all of AT&T stock, you know, like at the bottom, quickly, you know, and like that, you know, those are, that's what happens to us as investors. If we're not careful, if we're, you know, too committed to one position, have too much money in our stocks, or don't really have a good strategy for when to buy, when to sell, et cetera. So that's what I saw in myself. And, you know, a lot of the products that I've developed have been strategies for essentially me becoming a better investor myself, seeing what works for me, talking to other people, and then bringing those products to the market. And I think that that's what's really unique about, you know, my work is that I'm really focused on, you know, what do real you know, flesh and blood, you know, retail investors need to succeed in the markets. And that might be different, Frank, than, uh, you know, what an MBA in finance needs, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're in the markets, right? Our customers are in the markets. We're running businesses. We're raising families, you know. We're not like watching the markets 24-7, you know, or intraday trading necessarily, right? Uh, we're dentists. We're doctors. We're entrepreneurs, we're teachers, you know, all kinds of different things that are kind of taking up our lives. So, you know, how do you really create tools and algorithms and opportunities for, you know, people who uh, don't want to spend their whole lives studying the markets, but still want to be successful investors, you know, that we can use those and, uh, you know, and hold our own and hopefully even outperform um, uh, the rest of the participants in the markets. So I think that's what's been kind of unique about my approach. Um, of course, I started out with simple uh, trailing stops, and I learned about those from Steve Sugarud, uh, you know, our uh, mutual friend, and you know, somebody mm -hmm. that I know both of us uh, admire uh, yep. immensely. And you know, I'm a mathematician and uh, and a computer guy, right? So I start taking simple trailing stops, like the 25% trailing stop, and and saying, well, what would it, what what would have happened if all the stocks that I picked, I just sold them on a mechanical 25% trailing stop instead of going through all those emotions about when to sell? And lo and behold, you know, a simple 25% uh, trailing stop strategy 
no emotion, right? No drama was like, oh, I, mean, I would have made twice as much money. Hmm. That sounds pretty good. So I don't have to go through all that emotional upheaval and I get to make twice as much money. I'll take that. You know, that sounds interesting to me. <laughs> so I back tested, you know, other people's portfolios. I even back tested Steve Sugarud newsletter track record. And he's got a phenomenal track record. But I see that a mechanical 25% uh, trailing stop strategy, I'm like, wait a minute. You know, he beat the S&P 500, but if he had just exited on a mechanical trailing stop strategy, he would have made, you know, like another 50% again. Well, how could that be? I learned about trailing stops from this guy. He's using trailing stops. Well, what I found is that he was actually, you know, he was using trailing stops to get out of his losers, but he was selling some of his winners early, right? It's like, oh, you know, we got into the stock. It went up 100% in six months. You know, let's take the money off the table now when, you know, because we got something that we weren't expecting to get. Well, I found that if you had let those winners run and only get out of them when a trailing stop hits, you know, then you could have, you know, that 100% gain in six months could have turned into a 1,000% gain in like two years, right? So that really kind of was shocking to me. Um, and then also really triggered my research into essentially behavioral finance. Uh, and now, you know, two Nobel Prizes in economics have been awarded, one to Daniel Kahneman and then the second one to Richard Thaler uh, in economics um, this past year about how, you know, when we're losing, we want to dig, our, dig ourselves out of the hole. We want to take more risk to get back to break even. So we're willing to put, take more risk, you know, put more money on the table when we're losing but when we're winning, we want to pull those profits off the table. That's kind of our, our bias that we bring to almost every decision. You know, we don't. So essentially, we create opportunities for our losers to get away from us, but we don't create opportunities for our winners to totally defy our expectations, to defy logic, right? So that was my first real, like, aha about, you know, why am I not succeeding to the degree that I know I'm capable of? And why are the vast majority of individual investors not succeeding to the degree that they're capable of? And it's because of these biases that we bring to the, you know, to our decision making that we're not really aware of and that are the exact opposite of what we need to be doing to be truly successful in investing. It's so funny you say that because how we're programmed is, you know, we, we buy at the exact wrong times and we sell at the wrong times, right? I mean, this is the way we're programmed. Where everyone says, I wish this market came yeah. down 20% so I could buy. It's down 20%. Everyone's like, I'm not going near the market. It's scary now, yeah, right? I, I remember when I was five years into investing, I'm like, man, if I had just done the exact opposite of everything I did in the market, I'd be a wealthy man. You know, like, how could that be? And you <laughs> and I know, Frank, you know, you're like, the markets make everybody feel this way, right? I mean, who goes into the markets and goes, oh, yeah, that was easy. I made a million dollars. It was nothing. <laughs> everybody goes, like, bankrupt three times, you know, before they finally figure it out. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, my gut instinct, my gun swinging, my shooting from the hip. Uh, you know, I guess I'm not as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> you know, like, uh, hmm, maybe I better be more disciplined about this. It, it's so, funny that yeah. it's funny that you say that because I, I'm going to use two sports analogies here because I want you to you talk yeah. about behavioral finance right and, and we're all emotional yeah. I don't care if you're the best hedge, biggest hedge fund manager or you're not there's a lot of emotions unless you have a, you know Renaissance and just it's a pure algorithm system but. When I look, right. like, say, the Philadelphia Eagles looked horrible, right? It, they had the, the same talent, the same everything, right? They had a couple injuries, whatever, yep. they won the Super last year. Now you have this year yep. they come in, they don't look that good. Their starting quarterback right. once gets hurt, they bring in Nick Foles. All of a sudden, they just beat the best team in a league at their stadium. It's not that their players are great, are better all of a sudden. It's just the, the sentiment around it, saying, hey, the last time this happened, we made the Super Bowl Talk about that because sentiment is so yeah. important when it comes to investing where you know, it's just it's emotional, it's feelings, and you're able to yeah. play through that through algorithms, right? Yeah. You know, uh, one quick side story here. One of my customers um, came up to me. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I just, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm a risk manager. But when it comes to my stocks, I get so emotional. I'm like, well, what's your day job? He says, oh, I'm a safety engineer for NASA. <laughs> You know, so he's like in his day job, you know, he's doing risk management and safety engineering for NASA. But when it comes to his stocks, he's like an emotional basket case, you know. And so 
Like, you know, we can be, you know, intelligent, have high IQs, be successful. But the bottom line is when it comes to money, when it comes to making decisions in, in investing, we're all emotional, you know. And people used to say about my work, you know, oh, you take the emotion out of investing. Um, and, uh, you know, I know what people mean when they say that, you know. I help kind of, uh, you know, help them make decisions that are a little more, you know, algorithmic and uh, take some of the emotion out of, you know, the impulsive emotions out of investing. But emotion, you know, investing is emotional. And it's our money, you know, it's our success, it's our family's futures, uh, you know, it's pride right? It's uh, exciting. So there's no way to completely take emotion out of investing. You know, your emotions are going to have a seat at the table, whether you like it or not, you know? And um, so really being able to kind of be in the markets and be able to manage your emotions, you know, I think that's what's really uh, critical. And I, you know, I do want people to be emotional about investing. I want people to be able to care about what they're invested in you know, like that, you know, yeah, like bringing Nick Foles in, uh, you know, and beating the Rams, right? Like, yes, when you can get the right emotions into investing, it can really, uh, you know, add to your success, I think. It can really elevate your game, right? But you got to make space for those inspiring, you know, and enduring emotions to, to be present instead of just like, oh, my God, uh, Elon Musk smoked pot on Joe Rogan's podcast and the stock's <laughs> down 20% today. Should I sell? You know, <laughs> that's not a, that's not an emotional, that's not an enduring emotion that's going to win a Super Bowl, right? That's an emotion <laughs> that's going to get you to make an impulsive decision, you know, that you're going to regret when you wake up the next morning. That's a good example because a lot of people sold because of that. And then this, I probably 250, 260 and it's, you know, whatever, 350, 360 now, but uh, it is I, amazing. Oh my and, God, this thing's toast. She's smoking pot on Joe Rogan's podcast. You know, <laughs> you, you know <laughs> it, it's it's funny because you know, you you brought up something that's interesting because a lot of times when I have educational segments and I talk in my newsletter, and, you know, we're saying things. It's not that we're geniuses because we made mistakes in the past. And one of the mistakes that I hear even from people in emails that I made in the past is when you're holding on to one of those losers that are down 70 percent, it's more than the stock just being down 70 percent. Right. Because that's the one you're focused on every day going. Why is it going down? Absolutely, well, maybe the sector's yeah. out of favor. Absolutely. And you're just yeah. like, you know, instead of looking for new ideas, there's great things. It's other, maybe the market's coming down. You're focusing on just these losers, but you know, you, there's going to be opportunities because the whole market's down. So talk a little bit more about that, you know, the emotional part, which we, we went over. But how many times have you heard that from just individual investors? Because I'm sure people have signed up to your system saying, wow, you know, you are taking the emotion out of this. And, and this is one of the reasons yeah. why, because you know, I hate seeing that when people are down 70% of the stock that I stopped out of, which I instructed people yeah. to sell. And they're still in it. And I just, you know, it's, it's just difficult. I hate seeing that. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's uh, uh, actual capital, right? That uh, your money that you have in the markets, but there's also your mental capital. And uh, I think every investor needs to be keeping track of their mental capital account. Just like, uh, you know, we're keeping track of the money in our, in our brokerage accounts, right? Because you're absolutely right, man. You get into one of those, tough situations where something's gotten away from you to the downside and you really start to, you know, focus on it uh, to the exclusion of other opportunities. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's a, an additional big risk of, you know, putting yourself in a tough position, um, you know, that you're not able to really manage anymore and that you let get away from you. So, you know, in my work, there's a couple of different ways of essentially making sure that you don't, get yourself into that position. And one is a, um, you know, a trailing stop strategy. And you know that I've evolved the, uh, you know, trailing stops uh, beyond just a simple, you know, fixed percentage trailing stop. I, I have a proprietary algorithm that I developed uh, that I call the volatility quotient or the VQ. And mm -hmm. it gives people an idea of, of how wide of a trailing stop to use on different stocks. So it might be, you know, uh, 11, 10, 11% on blue chips like Johnson and Johnson or Walmart. It might be 17, 18% on, you know, kind of blue chip tech stocks like Microsoft and Apple, uh, Tesla, Twitter, and the, you know, 35%, let's say, 
um, junior gold mining companies, 50, 60, 70 <laughs> percent. Yeah, so those, you know, th- that's basically telling investors how much you know noise or randomness is in this stock if I want to hold it for 12 months or more. So instead of using a 25 percent trailing stop, you know, look, if Johnson and Johnson falls 25 percent, then it's like the world's ending, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but, that's what's you know, happening. But, yeah. uh, you know, Tesla can fall 25%, you know, in a month, right? And that's normal for Tesla, right? You got to yep. be able to you got to be prepared to to be okay with that if you want to be in Tesla, you know, to have Musk literally take you to Mars or the moon or wherever he's going, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's one thing having a sell strategy that you have confidence in. But the other part of it, and this was something I discovered a little later in my in my work, Frank, is deciding how much to invest in different opportunities, and just how I use that volatility quotient to decide kind of where where my sell point is. I also use that volatility quotient to decide how much to invest in different opportunities. And I'm and and if you put more money into the stocks with lower volatility quotients, and then I like to say just the right amount of money into stocks when that are very speculative and you're swinging for the fences, you know, um, then you know, uh, let's say a highly speculative biotech stock that doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't get the results in its, uh, you know, in its FDA trials um, uh, right away and, and takes a 25, 30% hit, you know, well, if you have the right amount of money in that stock, you're like, okay, well, 30%, that's, that's rough, ouch, but you know what? I didn't have too big of a position in this stock, but now I got to make an emotional decision. You know, I was prepared for the possibility of a 30% correction, you know, because I'm using the right sell strategy and because I've invested the right amount. Now, you know, you're, you're like, you've heard the, I know you've heard the phrase strong hands and weak hands, right? Mm -hmm. You know, now you're the strong hands in the market. You know, you're not going to get shook out of your position just because of, of, you know, random movements that are, you know, beyond your control to predict, right? Um, so I call it the sleep number, you know? <laughs> I wish I had uh, copyrighted or, you know, trademarked that <laughs> phrase, but unfortunately, uh, you know, a, uh, a mattress company uh, came up with it instead, <laughs> you know? But uh, people have to have their sleep number for different stocks, different investments. You know, what, you know, what strategy do you need to be able to be invested in this and still be able to sleep at night? And I think, you know, that really... Um, in a nutshell, describes what uh, what I think my work has uniquely done for a lot of investors, and what I've kind of uniquely contributed is to to help people feel like they can be involved, you know, and and be managing their risk and not have to be, you know, just terrified of disaster coming around the corner, uh, you know, any day now, right? And uh, and you know, having a itchy trigger finger. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And, you know, like you said, trade stops, it's not just about, you know, it's more than just stops, but you talked about position sizing, asset allocation. Could you take us through uh, like a real life example of somebody? Because I love what your website does where it's, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned volatility, uh, quotient and, and algorithms, right? So when mm-hmm. people, I'm sure mom and pop investors are like, whoa, whoa, what's going on, right? But you, I mean, you do <laughs> right. all the work for them and tell them, because it's basically you're taking their portfolio, throwing it into your system, and then all you know you're doing all the work for them, right? So take that through that process. If someone was like, "Hey, you know what? I want to try this. Here's my portfolio: E Trade or Meritrade." You know, take us through that part. So um, you know, subscribers to Trade Stops can literally uh, download their portfolios from over two dozen online brokers right now. Uh, one of the things a lot of people appreciate about Trade Stops is it's sort of a a one stop shop for um, you know, because like I have an account at, uh, used to be Options Express, now it's Schwab. You know, I have a couple accounts at Ameritrade. I got a uh, 401k account, you know, at Fidelity. But I'm able to download all those different portfolios into Trade Stops and use Trade Stops as a single kind of portfolio management location, right? Um, and then in addition, uh, as a consumer of financial research, uh, we work with you know, like 10 plus publishers now. And um, so I'm uh, um, subscribers to different research companies are able to actually get the newsletter recommendations inside of trade stuff. So now you've got, you know, your existing brokerage accounts, potentially your newsletter recommendations from a lot of different publishers. And now those are all together in one place. 
you know, you can see your portfolios. Uh, in trade stops, we have a simple yellow light, red light, green light system that's based on kind of our sell strategy together with some momentum indicators. So you can see kind of where your investments stand relative to this red light, yellow light, green light system. And, um, and also investments that you're considering adding to your own portfolio uh, as well. So all of that's in trade stops. We cover U.S. stocks, Canadian stocks, London stocks, Australian stocks. <laughs> In the U.S., we also cover options, uh, ETFs, and mutual funds. So it's quite a vast database that, uh, um, you know, uh, pretty much has everything that you might possibly be interested in. So, you know, somebody coming into TradeStop, initially, they're probably coming in thinking, oh, that, you know, Dr. Smith is right. You know, I need a more systematic way to decide when to sell, decide how much to invest. Those are simple tools in TradeStops, you know, but... uh, um, you know, you can set up trailing stops. You can use our red light, yellow light, green light system. You can use our position size calculator. Uh, but, you know, I've been at this for uh, 13 years now, Frank. <laughs> and I'm uh, very passionate about developing uh, even more um, powerful tools uh, that, you know, make investing decisions easier and easier still kind of customizable and, and individualized for people, right? We're not managing their, your money. We're not making the decisions for you. But, um, but we have just incredible tools. Um, one of them, for example, I call the risk rebalancer. And, uh, you know, how I talked about putting more money into lower volatility stocks and less money into higher volatility stocks. This risk rebalancer, like, okay, give, give the – you know, what's in your portfolio now or 20 stocks that you want in your portfolio? How much money do you want to spread across these stocks? Say $100,000. Click a button and it tells you exactly how much money to put into each stock. So you have equal risk, um, you know, based on position size across all the stocks in that portfolio and that amount of money. So that's a great illustrative example of how we've been able to evolve these tools and strategies and use the power of technology and, uh, and software design to give uh, individual investors just absolutely, you know, original, unique, novel ways to improve their decision-making in their own investing. Yeah, and so far you can tell you've been successful just for the fact that how fast you guys are growing and, and things like that. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the system as well. I'm a fan of you, Rich, as you know. I just wanted to end with this really quick because you did such a great job explaining okay. everything. We covered it. Um, I yeah. just saw a commercial for Trade trade Stops on CNBC that you were on. So now that you're big time, does that mean you're going to forget about us little guys or what? <laughs> well, you know, Frank, I actually did a TV commercial when I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and I did a McDonald's commercial. Um, so <laughs> nice. it's... it's <laughs> and I mean, you know, you had if you blinked, you would have missed me in the commercial. Uh, of course, my mom saw me, but uh, um, <laughs> you know, my sister went on to be a successful actress actually uh, in her career. So it is kind of ironic and funny for me to be back on TV now, <laughs> advertising my own business. You know, it's like, oh, I guess that acting class back when I was 13 actually paid off a little bit. Um, but uh, hey, you know, you know me, man. I'm I'm very passionate about what I'm doing. I feel like I have a unique message and, you know, and I've been at this, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm an overnight success of, you know, 15 years in the making, right? <laughs> so, uh, I like that. I like of, that. <laughs> 15 years of overnight success, right? But over that 15 years, you know, I've worked with 50,000 investors today, you know, 30,000 people are using trade stuff and they're tracking over $20 billion of their own, uh, you know, assets inside of trade stops. And I've spoken to probably, you know, a hundred different audiences. And, um, you know, and over and over again, I've seen people, you know, nod their heads like, yeah, yeah, that's me. You know, yeah, that guy's talking about me. Um, so just that, you know, conviction that's built up over watching, you know, my message be received by audience after audience is like, hey, man, you know, let's. Want, you know, let, let's, let's, let's swing for the fences here. You know, let's take this to the masses. <laughs> Why not? You know, and going back to kind of our original conversation around being an entrepreneur, Frank, you know, I know you probably know this, but I remember at a certain point in my career, you know, you have a lot of self-doubt. You know, you're like, 
oh, you know, I might not be perfect. I'm not sure I want to put it out there yet. But at a certain point, it's like, you know, why not me? You know, why not just go for it? Why not unleash it, you know, and try to just see where this thing's going to go? So that's what those commercials are about. You know, for me, it's like, why not? You know, let's, let's put it out there. We got a good track record. We got a great product. We care about our customers. Um, and uh, we've had great results so far. So, hey, man, let's think, swing for the fences. Maybe when uh, Nick Foles is winning the next Super Bowl, I'll <laughs> I'm be running so. my first Super Bowl ad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just remember uh, that. You know, because as entrepreneurs and, 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 you know, like you said, it's like, wow, let's grow this thing. Let's keep growing. And, you know, yeah. sometimes you you don't reflect on what you've accomplished. And that's been one of my problems. Yeah. Sometimes you just take a step back and say, holy cow, look where we are. Great We're point, always Great in grow point. mode, right? We got to grow, 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 grow. And what right. you've accomplished, like you're on CNBC, you're on TV, you're growing your business. It's yeah. becoming a major, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's pretty cool. But that's one of the mistakes that I always make where I just don't take a step back and enjoy it. Oh. And it's always grow. You got to grow the business, grow, it, grow, it, grow. It just, you know, if you succeed, that's just take a step back yeah. a little bit and say, wow, this is pretty cool, you know, at least sometimes, I guess. Yeah, a role to make, you know, I mean, you're always under pressure in business, you know, it's never easy. So that, that is a uh, excellent point to end on, Frank. Thanks for, thanks for the reminder. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, listen, yeah, your job's never uh, done. And uh, <laughs> owning your own company now, last thing here is if, uh, if someone wants to learn more about this, a try a system and trade stops, uh, Rich, what's the easiest way they could do it? Go to trade stops. Dot com, uh, T-R-A-D-E-S-T-O-P-S, tradestops.com. Um, you know, we have a money-back guarantee on all our trials. Uh, there's a lot of information there on the website. You know, I'm very passionate about education. You know, just uh, hop on board. Uh, you got nothing to lose. And Frank, you know, congrats on your success. It's great to see you, you know, uh, out on your own and uh, taking these risks. I know it's not easy. And succeeding, man. It's awesome. And what an awesome podcast. I appreciate it, man. Listen, thanks for coming on. Don't be a stranger. We'll have you on soon. And um, yeah, if you ever need anything, just give me a shout. Thank you so much for doing this, man. I know you're traveling a lot. You do a lot of things now and doing commercials all over the place and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for hopping on the podcast, man. All right. And, uh, Likewise. We'll talk soon. Thank you. You bet. Bye. Right, great stuff from Richard. I know Rich for a long time. Golf together, a good guy. And just see his business succeed and how hard he's working. Uh, you know, we're kind of in the same boat, but, uh, I meant that you do have appreciation for a lot of our competitors out there that we worked for. And, you know, for me, I was just writing a newsletter and sometimes, you know, it wouldn't get done on time or, you know, not because of me, you know, I'm a stickler to really get things done on time. But, um, you know, it just, there's a whole process behind it that I really didn't appreciate how hard people work behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, now you run your own company, you really do have appreciation for, for a lot of the guys, even I mentioned Stansberry, uh, you know, the guys that, uh, at Money Map and, you know, a lot of the Gore affiliates and stuff like that and Banyan Hill and, and things like that and the Gore Financial, you know, again, it's a small industry, so we all know each other, but uh, you do have an appreciation of respect and, uh, you know, now that you're in the same boat with them that I never knew unless you actually do and how much work now, how difficult it is and how many people you deal with and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I hope you guys love that conversation. I mean, it was, you know, talk about being entrepreneurs. We talked about, you know, uh, just how important it is. and. You know, sometimes maybe it's my fault while I come over on this podcast and, you know, it's not that we sound like know-it-alls. It's that we're trying to teach you from the mistakes that we made in the past that you don't have to make. Them. And sometimes it's, that's not a good thing to do. Sometimes you have to make those mistakes. You know, when you, if you have a model portfolio and you're covering stocks and it's down 40%, you don't care. You're not looking at it. But if you have money in it and, and you're, you lost 40%, you, you care. You know, you're like, why is this stock down? You start digging. You go through the emotional periods and everyone's emotion, like Rich said, no matter how much you you know, you think you're not, everybody is. Everybody is. I mean, you saw Ackman and Icon on TV, right? I mean, what was that, three years ago, whatever it was? How crazy was that? You know, they would go, oh, I'm, I'm a bigger millionaire than you, and I'll beat you up. I came from Queens. I don't know if he came from the areas of Queens that I came from, but I just thought that was a funny statement that Icon made. But, you know, you, you see how emotional it gets, right? Because billionaires want to destroy other billionaires. <laughs> it's just normal, I guess. I'll let you know if that ever happens to me on a billionaire, if there's any truth to that. But, I mean, there is truth to it, but... <laughs> Uh, and I don't think I've ever met a billionaire that's happy either. So it, it was just kind of weird, right? Just ironic. But there is emotions involved and you take a lot of that emotion out by following these rules. So instead of focusing on that loser that's down 70% going, why is it down? Man, should I buy more? And you maybe bought more where it's down another 20%, another 30%. It's gone. You're not thinking about it. Now you're looking at the rest of the market saying, wow, these are really good situations. You know what? Gold's really starting to kick in here. Gold prices are moving higher. I see gold moving higher. You know, the dollar's getting weaker. 
you know, we've seen a bear market in gold for how many freaking years? I mean, it's a cyclical market, and how many years has it been? It's been disgusting, terrible. Our friends in this industry, you know, but now you're seeing that. Maybe, hey, you know what? I want to buy a couple of – scale into a couple of gold stocks, and that makes sense. So hopefully you guys appreciate that interview. I always say this podcast is about you. It's not about me. Let me know what you thought. Frank at CurseyResearch.com. That's Frank at CurseyResearch.com. Now let's get to my educational segment because I'm going to do something that nobody does, but it's important. I hope you guys appreciate it because I do have losers. Two of the biggest losers I had last year were GE, which I got dead wrong, which we stopped out of, and one of the other ones was Debold. Okay. Look at my portfolio. It's performed well. Yes, everything is coming down along with everything else, but we've had 15 out of 16 stocks that were up, doing well. We took profits in a couple of things, including Amazon, near its highs, and we still have a half position in it, which come down. But still, you know, we've done the things that we've sold. Skyworks Networks, MindBody are probably down 30% below where we sold them, so we did a pretty good job, and we're sticking to our stops. But I want to talk to you about the losses because that's what we learned the most, all right? So I'm putting my ego aside, and when it came to Diebold, this company I covered for a long time, which we did very well on two, three times, and the stock came down a ton. Uh, this is uh, the leader in banking technologies and ATMs, and people are like, well, it's hardware, it's ATMs, it's more than that. It's all services, cloud technology. All these banks need to upgrade. You know, supposed to be a safe company. Been operating for over 100 years. Elliot Ness was a former CEO of this company. That should tell you how old it is. Held one of the longest streaks, or the longest streaks for consecutive annual, annual dividend increases at 59 years. That was broken, I think, three, four years ago because they decided to take over. I think they were number two, and they took over the number three competitor, which made them number one. And when you think about consecutive annual dividend increases, you know, when I said at 59 years, I mean, we're talking about longer than McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, the rest of the Dow, everybody in the Dow Jones, this little company. So it was a good name, had great growth catalyst because – you had the largest customers, the biggest banks, flush with cash, and they needed to upgrade their systems, which they said on their conference calls, you know, update the, their technology, and they signed contracts. They basically said, okay, with Diebold, you know, we're signing with you, but they were delaying those orders. So basically, it was showing up with billions of dollars in potential revenue in their backlog. I won't say, obviously, it's not guaranteed, but a lot of times that, you know, counts for future revenue. It's a good indication of a company. They delayed a couple of times, uh, you know, and, and yeah, it did. They spent a lot of money to buy their largest competitor, Wincord Nixoff was its name. Uh, and it turned out to be a couple of quarters delays, then a year, then a year and a half. And the stock fell tremendously. And you're seeing all these orders in the balance sheet. Again, this is usually a good stock. It was paying a two and a half dip dividend now because it got cut. Thought it was a great buy. It was dirt cheap at the time. And then revenue would stop coming in. You had the guys from... Windorf that said, hey, you know what? We, we want to sell our position in the company. Uh, and then you're seeing the stock come down, revenue not coming in. And the reason why the banks were just on the sidelines because they were saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties out there about new regulations, deteriorating market conditions, especially globally. We just want to wait before we actually, you know, have you guys come in and you know, redo all of our systems. So when I first recommended the trade, I, I said, hey, we're placing a 35% stop on our cost basis. And in May, our stop was triggered. So we sold for a loss. So we sold around 1290. Again, we stole from a 35% loss. And that's when the you know what hit the fan. So the story was still intact when we sold it. It was. I was you know, the contracts were there, everything was still okay. They were just like warning, and the management was optimistic, saying, look, you know, they're gonna come around. You know, big banks still need to upgrade their technology. And I could have justified, you know. Just saying, you know what, guys, stay in this one. It's a good name. Ignore our stop. You know, it's a dividend payer, you know, since the thesis was still sound. But we always follow our stops. It's a 35% stop, and we follow it. I thought 99% of the time, I think it was only one or two times I said, hey, guys, let's increase the stop. One of those times, the stock more than doubled. And the other time, I think the stock did, did pretty good as well. But you always want to stick to your plan. And we sold out of the stock at 1290 Now, here's what happened. Banks continued to delay orders. Sales and earnings declined rapidly. This forced Diebold to renegotiate its debt with creditors, triggering tons of downgrades, debt downgrades by you know, major credit agencies. And you had Diebold decline another 70% from where we stopped out of the position. 70%. So now when we're down 35%, I'm talking about another 70% it declined. People don't talk about that. 
right? They're just like, well, 35% loss is supposed to be a good stock. I mentioned on the podcast and I get it. You know, I had a lot of conviction in it and it's a company I liked. I looked at fundamentals. I said, I love when companies delay where they say, well, you know, a contract's being delayed. It's going to be paid. Usually the stock will fall, but eventually it's going to get paid and it gives you a, a chance. You know, I've made a lot of money on, on using that strategy where it's just delay. These are in the backlog. It's eventually going to come through. And now the stock's down 25% as if, Nobody was going to pay them. So I thought it was a good buying opportunity. I was wrong. Again, everything looks like it's going to fit sometimes, and it just doesn't. But we followed our stops, and we avoided a catastrophic loss. I mean, that money is gone. And sometimes you'd put a lot of money into a situation. Once that happens, you're sitting there going, you know, I just lost. I mean, you lose 70 80% of your money. And say if you have all your money in one sector, like mining, there's so many great mining stocks out there. And we triggered stops two times because I thought, you know, two different times that we'd be okay. I mean, we made up those losses easily because we did great in 2016 and several gains, two, 300% gains in, in several of our stocks. Though the dynasty went up 900% in seven months when it came back and gave you that one. So I'm okay taking some losses because we know when this bottoms, these stocks in mining, they don't go up 100%. They go up three, four, five X, 10 X. That's how depressed they are. But say if you have your whole entire portfolio of mining stocks, now, I mean, that's 70%, 80%, 90% of your capital wiped out. Now you're looking at a market trading at its cheapest level in five years where you could probably start picking away at certain situations that you like, not going all in, position sizing, taking a third position here, maybe it comes down, buy a little bit more, you, you know, improve your cost basis. Instead, that money's gone. So it's very important. Nobody talks about this because it's not good marketing. I don't like coming out of here and saying, hey, highlighting a loser that I know you guys, you know, with Diebold or GE and stuff like that. But that's how you learn to be, become a better investor. You know, if I didn't, if it wasn't right more than times that I'm wrong, obviously I wouldn't be doing this for 25 years. But it's important to focus on that. You know, it, when it comes to your losers, you know, again, people just don't want to talk about it. You know, they always say it's not good marketing, but even personally, you, know, you always hear from your friends when they have winners, right? Oh, man, I got this stock. Yeah, well, before it. Well, 90 percent, you never hear like, oh, I just lost 70 percent. They don't talk about that, your friends, right? Everybody talks about their winners. But we all have losing positions from time to time. Instead of ignoring the bad, prepare for it, embrace it, learn from it, because that's what the greatest investors do, because you're going to have them. You have a lot of volatility in the market. If you're a trader and you say, well, 35 percent you know, is a big stop. The only time I use 35 percent stops is if I believe, based on my research, that that stock has more than 100 percent upside within 18 to 24 months. I'm not giving, doing a 35% stop if I believe the stock has 50% upside. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to take on that much risk. So you want to take on little risk in terms of your percentage gains and how high you think they're going to be based on your research or based on whoever you're listening to. So again, learn from it. Embrace it. Use stops. The whole podcast is based on you know limiting your losses, portfolio management, which is very important during these times because 2019, look, a lot of good ideas out there. The risks that push this market down over the past three months may not exist. I don't see the Fed continue to raise rates through 2019. I don't see China, unless they want to go into a depression and see their GDP actually fall negative, which could happen in 12 months if they don't, if these trade wars continue, which is going to hurt us, but it's going to hurt them 10 times more. Again, it hurt them since February. The market was down 25% while we hit all-time highs through September. So for them to get back at us and say, well, now it's hurting the U.S., it's hurting them much, much more. That's why you saw them, you know, agree to cut auto tariffs. And you're not going to see this trade war, which is not really a trade war right now, but you're not going to see it continue. And I, I, the first quarter tops, I think this isn't going to be a risk in the market. Interest rates aren't going to be a risk. Now you have a cheap market right now with a lot of growth catalysts, especially through buybacks, especially consumer spending is strong. You're going to see the housing market come back and rebound a little bit with interest rates, which is a big driver of the economy because when you buy new houses, you buy everything within a house. So you've got a lot of catalysts heading into 2019. But again, be sure to limit your losses. That's what this whole podcast was about. Hopefully you got it. Let me know what you thought about this podcast. Again, it's almost the whole thing was educational. Uh, but at this time, and being nervous and being December, I just wanted to say, hey, you know what, guys? It's okay. We are seeing losses. Everyone's seeing them. Limit them. But 2019 is set up to be a pretty good year because the catalysts or the things that pushed us down or those risks that pushed us down the past few months aren't really going to exist after the first quarter next year, which could result in a pretty big rally. Again, we'll monitor it. I have this podcast going every week, uh, and we'll be updating the data and stuff like that. But 
guys, be safe out there. Make sure you limit your losses because it's going to be a good time to buy a lot of great, great companies, industry leaders at some of the cheapest valuations they trade in more than five years. Huh. Okay, guys. So long podcast. That's it for me. I want to maybe wish you and your families happy holidays. Have fun. Again, I always say this during the holidays. Don't talk politics. Don't talk stocks. Relax. Enjoy. Eat. Drink a few beers. Watch football. Have fun. We will be off next week. Get my old company off. I will be publishing one of the best podcasts of the year for you. It is Evergreen. <laughs> so I'll leave it as a surprise, but I'll give you a little hint because this person did predict the current crash. I told you guys to buy gold a few months ago, and he was dead on. So we play it next week because his advice is still relevant today. One of the best podcasts. I'm not going to tell you to guess, although eh, you probably figured it out already if you listen to this podcast. But that's a podcast that's going to be up next week. I'm going to two of them up, which is pretty cool. But anyway, happy holidays. Thanks so much for all your support. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys in 14 days instead of seven. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.